uh, as we think about Palm Sunday together, I want to share with you on one specific theme, one concept I'd like to develop for the course of the next half hour or so, and that is I want to talk with you about the problem of unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. I, I really think that everybody here, even if you're a young person, three, four, five years old, and up, you know the basic fundamental dilemma of unmet expectations. It's just a basic and recurring issue of human experience. Kids, I think a lot of times you wonder, am I really living up to what my mom and dad want of me? Employees, you're always curious, am I doing what my boss actually expects me to be doing? Students, some of you are struggling because it seems like your teachers are always moving the goalposts and, and you can't ever really fulfill what they want out of you. Unmet expectations. And I just think this is a problem in so many arenas of life. This past week, I came across an interesting article online about how this can be such a challenge, especially for people who are in, in leadership in life. Uh, expectations can be a challenge because people both expect you to be decisive as a leader and also to be patient as a leader. Which expectation will you meet? People want you to be introspective and also extroverted. People expect you to be a straight talker, to, to call a spade a spade. And they also want you to be diplomatic in everything you say. You should be hands-on and also not a micromanager. You should be visionary and also pragmatic. You should be sympathetic to the personal struggles of people around you and also intolerant of underperformance when you see it. And it feels like in life we can be pulled apart by so many different expectations that others have for us. How can we possibly hope to meet them on this journey of life? Well, today's message this morning is about the expectations that people placed on Jesus Christ. This is a message about the assumptions people had regarding Jesus and about how Jesus responds to them. Let's set up the story for just a moment. It's the last week before Jesus is crucified, church. Jesus has cured a blind man in Jericho, Bartimaeus. Remember, we talked about this story a couple of weeks ago. And now Jesus has continued forward, upward in elevation, westward in direction, from Jericho toward Jerusalem. And he's staying at night in the Jerusalem suburb of Bethany with his friends, three siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It seems like Jesus actually crashes at Lazarus' house pretty often. And that's maybe not so surprising, especially when you remember that there is an ancient tradition that anytime someone raises you from the dead, that person is allowed to couch surf at your house whenever they want to, right? If that ever happens to you, that's the rule. So Jesus spends lots of time at Lazarus' home. Jesus is heading to the Passover because it was expected of every Jewish man that he would bring an offering to sacrifice at the temple for Passover. And as an obedient Jewish man who fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law, Jesus is doing that. He is coming to the temple to present this offering. But what people don't realize is that when Jesus comes to Jerusalem to present an offering, Jesus is himself the Passover lamb. He's bringing himself. Now, as we pick up in Luke chapter 19, I'd love it if you turn there in your Bibles, Jesus is making plans to ride actually physically into the city of Jerusalem. So he is going to take a ride from Bethany, kind of on one side, the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, over the crest of this hill and ride on down toward the capital city of Jerusalem. So let's pick up in our Bibles and just follow along as I read Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 28. 
This is the word of the Lord. Now, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Now, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? All you got to say is, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why exactly are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, they threw their cloaks on the colt, and they put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And listen, church, this is what they said. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Things are about to shift dramatically at verse 41. Here we go. Now, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls, and they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, gang, I love Palm Sunday. I think if I had to choose, I would say Palm Sunday is my favorite worship Sunday of the year. It's springtime, Flowers are blooming, trees are starting to bud, kids are waving their branches, there is joy, there's expectation of Easter ahead of us. And by the way, the pastor never has to wonder what he's going to preach about on Palm Sunday. He always knows. But friends, that said, even after about 15 years of preaching on the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, I still experience this story, this event as a person who, who has a whole lot of questions about what's happening in this triumphal entry. And in many ways, this story about Jesus riding to the city is kind of a, a biblical jigsaw puzzle with, with different pieces that need to be fitted together. And I think that's especially the case if you'd actually kind of pick up and read each of the four gospel accounts of this story in sequence, because different things happen in different gospels. I mean, here's just a couple of questions that I have. Question number one, how does this grand celebration actually get started? What launches this? The Bible says the people begin to praise God for all they had seen. Right? But if this is the triumphal entry, what do the people believe the triumph is over? Right? Question two, with which animals does Jesus ride into Jerusalem? Is there one donkey? Are there two donkeys? It kind of depends on which story you read. How many people are actually celebrating? Is this just an enormous, vast number of thousands of people? Or is this maybe Jesus' inner circle of disciples? I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that yet. Number four, would this have been a concern to the Roman soldiers in the area? What did they think when they saw this? Were they like, you know, just getting on, on the radio and saying, you know, we got a 1027 coming down the Mount of Olives here. We got to check this out. Or, 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 or did they just laugh at this like a big superstitious kind of comedy? What did they think? 
And then lastly, I wonder, as a kind of a scholar of the Bible, why people are acting so much like they're celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. They're doing a lot of Feast of Tabernacles kind of things when the Bible says it's the Feast of Passover. Now, interesting questions. And if you are an eager student of the Bible, and if you are set on biblical literacy as a personal goal in your life, and by the way, I hope that you are, I mean, I just want to set these questions before you as maybe things to think about over the course of the next few days. But for this morning, we really only have time to drill down on one question. And it's a question that might have come to your mind, too, as we were reading along this morning. The question is this, why does Jesus cry at the end of the triumphal entry? Why does Jesus find this celebration to be a cause of personal pain? Why is this? Now, I think in the general sense, it's not so strange to think of Jesus weeping. Jesus is, the Bible says, he's an emotional person. And the Gospels tell us in a number of places that Jesus gets angry, that he gets frustrated, that he grieves with sadness. Jesus is not a stoic. He cries. But why now? Hadn't Jesus just had the experience of a lifetime? So thinking about this sermon, I, I was remembering a, a time, I chose not to put it up on video, though I have it recorded, where our son Jericho, when he was a little boy, was crying, kicking and screaming because he was so mad and because he so badly wanted us to get in the car and leave Disney World. He'd had it. He was so sick of being at Disney World that Tammy and I videotaped this. So the next time he says, Mom and Dad, when are you going to take me to Disney World? We're going to say, this is what you thought of it the last time, son. <laughs> crying when you go to Disney World. Why is Jesus crying at this moment of extraordinary joy and celebration? I mean, look at the story. Hosannas are shouted as people look to Jesus for salvation. Hosanna means save us now. People wave palms as signs of Jesus' delivering power. Cloaks are laid on the street as a mark of a royal pathway. Everything, church, everything seems to be going the way it's supposed to be going. And then this, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over it, Luke says. And if you ever have the chance to visit Jerusalem, you can see why this is the word Luke has chosen, over it. Because actually, in, in sort of a real sense, in kind of a topographical sense, Jesus is looking down on Jerusalem at this time. There along the triumphal entry route in Jerusalem, you can visit this place. This is called the Dominus Flevit church. And Dominus Flevit is Latin for the Lord wept. This is the church of the Lord's weeping. And you can see, looking through the window of the church, a view down upon the dome of the rock. That's what's there now. But when Jesus was on this site, he would have been looking westward, down from the Mount of Olives, onto the temple in Jerusalem. He would have seen lambs being selected or Passover, from his vantage point. He would have seen pilgrims and Sadducees and merchants and Romans. He would have seen his nation, the people of Israel. He would have witnessed them going about their daily lives without a whole lot of concern for the parade that was going on on the Mount of Olives. Why is it that Jesus weeps at the sight of the city of Jerusalem, church? Here's the answer I want to develop for you over the next couple of minutes. Jesus cries after the triumphal entry because while some people recognized some aspects of Jesus' kingship, as the king of all kings, Jesus wants all people to observe all aspects of his royal authority. See, Jesus doesn't 
I don't think pour forth tears because of what has happened. Jesus weeps because of what does not happen, what has not happened. So many in that moment, on that day, as Jesus says, do not recognize Jesus' true kingly mission. Now, one of the ways that we're able to make sense of this and to understand this, this puzzle is through the work of historical research. And one type of event that uh, historians are learning more and more about is the experience of the triumphant royal procession of conquerors and kings when they came into cities. After great battles, generals, military leaders, champions, and Caesars would have these enormous victory parades that would come into cities and towns in the empire. And this parade was called a parousia. And that becomes a very important word in the New Testament church, by the way, parousia. And at the parousia parade, a number of things are known to have happened with regularity and commonality. The, the king would ride in, right? The, not walk, but ride on a horse or in a chariot. People would shout praise and gratitude for their deliverance. They would hang wreaths and other plants and branches, and they would bring out special robes, and there would be all kinds of celebration. Some historians say Darren DeYoung would ring a bell and tell everybody to scrub the streets as well. I mean, it's a great big parade. Now, we know a lot about how these parades played out in the ancient world. And because we know so much, we know that there was this twist as well. Don't miss the twist. The twist is, if you didn't have the right parade in the right way, with the right amount of celebration, that conqueror could turn around and destroy your city. Cities, historians tell us, were punished because they did not welcome the king in the proper way. In fact, historians like Josephus, Dio Cassius have pointed out that the failure to properly hail the conquering hero would on occasion lead to cities being besieged. In other words, surrounded by the army of the general. If you didn't throw the right parade, if you didn't celebrate in the right way, if you did not do it exactly the way the king expected, he could turn around and wrap your city in troops and besiege it. Now, with that in mind, listen again to Jesus' words in verses 41 to 43. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. What is Jesus describing there? He's describing a siege, the siege of Jerusalem. Jesus is lamenting the doom and destruction of a city that did not properly welcome its true king. The city that did not know what would really bring it peace. A city that had the wrong expectations for Jesus. That wanted something else. And check this out. The, you know, we've got these, these palm-waving Passover pilgrims. And I, and I really believe that they were onto a lot of what Jesus was about. They understood Jesus was the son of David, that he was the true king. A lot of people got a lot of what was going on, but there were a whole lot of people who just sat it out. A whole lot of people in that city who didn't care. A whole lot of people who didn't think Jesus would, would do what they needed him to do. They did not appreciate who he was, and they were looking for a different kind of king. 
a different kind of power, a different kind of dominion. And Jesus knows because they want that kind of king, because that's what they crave, because that's their set of expectations, it will ultimately lead to their destruction. You know, it's, it's so clear uh, when students of the Bible look at the triumphal entry, they see how many obvious ways Jesus claims kingship in this story. I mean, there's allusions and references, yes, to kind of the way that the Greek and Roman champions came into the city, but also Jesus is acting like King Solomon. He's behaving like uh, King J.Q. He is fulfilling what was prophesied in Zechariah 9. Along the way, he accepts praise as being the son of David. It's like Jesus, after three years of kind of like, shh, not yet, shh, kind of doing this, he's like, bring it on, bring it on. Let me hear you. Bring it on. Lift up the whole. Jesus accepts all this. He's like, I, I am the king. I, this is who I am. I, I am about to restore Israel to divine rulership. Jesus was embodying the hopes of thousands of years. He is enacting kingship in an Old Testament way. I mean, it was clear. And yet so many people disregarded Jesus. They could not see what would bring them peace on that very day. Jesus says, on this, on this very day, this is the day, this is the time, this is the moment, this is the day. And Jesus wept because the expectations were not calibrated properly for Israel's true king. I think lots of us know the pain of having expectations left unfulfilled, right? It's just, I mean, that's kind of what the definition of disappointment is. When what you hope for does not materialize. And there's great pain in, in not receiving the thing you dreamed for and hoped would come to pass. But you know what? As painful as that is, here's, you already know this. That kind of pain is nothing compared to the pain you have when you cannot fulfill other people's expectations. Some of you, you know, it's Christmas time and you're hoping for that uh, Nintendo Switch or that designer jacket or something else. And, and then when you open your present and you get like an electric toothbrush or something like that, it's not even close, you're discouraged. But you know what people who get electric toothbrushes in lieu of Nintendo Switches never do? They never look at the gift giver and say, this is a terrible gift. Why did you give me this? They never look at the gift giver and say, this stinks. Why did you give me this? And why don't they? Because even disappointed people know that conveying that their expectations are left unmet destroys the giver. Grandma, have you ever had a grandchild tell you that what you gave him or her for Christmas was not what they wanted? I mean, that's utter devastation, isn't it? Especially if it's something you're like unable to provide. Grandma, this is, this is not what I wanted. There's just an existential kind of collapse when you cannot provide for another person what that other person has always hoped you could provide for them. And I think this is why Jesus weeps, church. He cannot give the people what the people want. It's not that he won't, but that he can't because his mission is different. It's not that they desire too much of Jesus and he cannot give it. It's that they desire too little of Jesus and they cannot see it. They did not know all that was required, as Jesus says, to truly make for peace, to truly create shalom in a person's life. Jesus had to do more than what they wanted, not less. 
I mean, it's, it seems pretty clear that for lots of people who came out to celebrate Jesus, what they thought was going to happen, what they wanted Jesus to do, was to kick off, light the candle on a great big military or political campaign. This, okay, this Jesus, he can do all these kinds of things. This is great. We're going we're gonna to get the Romans out of here. Jesus is going to do for Jerusalem what David did to the Canaanites so many years ago, to the Jebusites. He's going to drive them out, and he's going to make it his capital. He's going to do in Jerusalem what Judas Maccabeus did to the Greeks a couple hundred years ago. He's going to kick them out, and we're going to have our political capital back. This is what Jesus is going to do. Politics. Military. At least the, the fact is, you can see this in verse 39. The way that people thought this about Jesus is apparent. There's this fascinating little cutaway. Look at your Bibles again. Verse 39. Some of the Pharisees, no great friends of Jesus, by the way, hear hosannas and cries of kingship. And what do they say? They say, Jesus, Jesus, get over here. Tell them to shut up, Jesus. Do you realize what's going to happen here? If they keep saying that you're the king, the Romans are going to come in and they're going to destroy us. Tell them to stop praising you. The problem is the Pharisees seem to think that this parade of Jesus would, in fact, bother the Romans so much to the point that they would punish the whole nation of Israel for becoming too stirred up. Quiet them down, Jesus. Do you want all of us to be punished for this thing? And I just love Jesus' response. Verse 40. Jesus tells them, if I quiet these people, the rocks on the side of the road are going to start singing Handel's Messiah. Jesus says, I have the very forces of nature, this whole world at my command. And you're concerned with a little Roman garrison, you Pharisees? All of creation, Pharisees, sings my praises. Look around you, stones, boulders, mountains. Jesus loves the praise of children, but Jesus also has the praise of stones and streams due to him. And this story, in so many elements, is Isaiah 55 coming true. Verse 12 of that chapter says this, You will go out with joy. You will be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. It's all coming true in this moment, on this day. Jesus is trying to lead out the people in peace. That's what he says. He says, I know, I get it. I understand what makes for peace. I'm not trying to avoid conflict with the Romans, but I am trying to bring peace on earth. But so few really understand it. They don't know that peace can only come, not with a small upending of a Roman garrison, but with the complete overthrow of the power of sin. See, that church is what the mission of a king of kings looks like. A piddly little Roman empire is too small a challenge. For Jesus Christ. Colossians 19, 1 verse 19 through 20 say this, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or in heaven. How, how does he make peace? By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's Jesus' plan. That's Jesus' purpose. That's why Jesus rides into the city, to reconcile all things, to make peace between heaven and earth through his blood. That church is what the assignment of a king of kings. Not a king, not a conqueror, not a general, but the Lord of the universe looks like. So let's get uncomfortably practical as we close. Why is it, church, that we have divides among Christians today. 
Why is it that there are liberal progressive Christians and there are conservative Christians? Why is this happening? I, I think in so many ways it's because we have minimized the mission of Jesus Christ. We have not seen what the ultimate mission of a king of kings looks like. We have turned Jesus from the king of kings into a cabinet member. Jesus could be secretary of this or administrator of that little thing, but not king of kings. We give Jesus authority in some areas of our lives, but other areas he's riding in and we're like, would you quiet down? Shh! Jesus, no, it's not. The, no, stay out of that one, Jesus. We minimize Jesus. We flatten him into, into just accomplishing small things. Some people stylize Jesus as a king only interested in pardoning sin. You know, if I could just be relieved of this sort of guilt that I feel in my life, then I would really have peace. That's what we think, but that's wrong. Other people proclaim Jesus as a king only over issues of economic inequity. You know, if only we could just redistribute the wealth, then the world would have peace. Some people distill Jesus to a, a king who is mainly focused on assisting you with your daily inconveniences. That's how you actually view Jesus day to day. If he would just help me with this big exam I got in chemistry, or give me that promotion, or maybe just help my parents understand why I need an iPhone, then I'll have peace. Some people recognize Jesus as, as mostly like a, a king who's interested in social conflict. That's the peace we need, a counselor. Or Jesus as a, a king over life's lessons, kind of a teacher. But church, don't you see what happens then when you think that's what Jesus is only about, that that's the only thing Jesus is ever concerned with? It's not a, simply a matter of having the wrong belief. When we start to think that way and we think all that really matters is that we end abortion, all that really matters is when we legalize gay marriage, all that Jesus really should be doing here is helping to redistribute wealth, we, we pick one topic and we sanctify it and we say the center of the gospel is this, and then we marginalize everybody else and we treat them so poorly. Because we have taken Jesus, who is the king of kings, and made him Jesus, the cabinet secretary. Listen, if all that mattered to Jesus in this world was overthrowing the Romans, he could have done it so easily. If all that mattered to Jesus was correcting unjust political systems to bring peace, he knew exactly where to find them. He, and yet Jesus does not march on the Roman Senate. He does not try to force Herod from the throne. If the only thing that mattered to church Jesus was feeding the hungry, if that's what it would take to bring peace, Jesus knew how to multiply bread. He knew how to feed and find starving people. But that's not why he rode in Jerusalem. If Jesus believed that acting simply with greater morality would bring peace on earth, he knew where to find the prostitutes, he knew where to find the tax collectors, and he did. But that's not why he mounted a donkey to go into Jerusalem. If Jesus thought that rescuing the unborn and harmless infants would save the world, he knew right where to find people practicing infanticide. There were plenty of them in his time, but that's not why he rode down the Mount of Olives. That's not the only thing he was about. See, what the kingship of Jesus means is that none of these things are important, unimportant, rather. On the contrary, they are of the utmost importance. And they are altogether signs that the world needs a king of kings to change all of them. And all of these griefs and pains are symptomatic of one singular and devastating force, and that is the power of sin and evil in this world. That's why we have political problems. That's why we have hunger. That's why we have oppression. That's why we have human trafficking. That's why we have immorality. That's why we have porn. All of it has one root cause. 
And Jesus said, I'm going after the root of all of it. Because I'm the king of all these things. So Jesus did the one thing that could set all of those things working in reverse. He laid down his life on the cross to make peace. It's true, Jesus was not the king Jerusalem wanted. They didn't celebrate as they should. And when Jesus saw a city that longed for a, a different kind of ruler, that failed to celebrate God's incredible inbreaking and reign, Jesus collapsed in lament. Because he knew that his coronation would not be with swords and spears, or gold and jewels. His would be a crown of thorns. And yet that is the thing. As we turn our attention to Maundy Thursday Church, the death of the king that will ultimately inaugurate the kingdom that the whole world truly does need. Let's pray. Jesus, we have minimized you. We've made you into tokens. We have assigned you jobs too small for a king of kings. Lord, we know that all the grief in the world, abuse, brokenness, hurting marriages, poverty, martyrdom, persecute, they all must be brought before the throne and transformed into something beautiful. Lord, may the rocks not cry out on our behalf. May we inaugurate you. May we welcome you and enthrone you as the king of all aspects of our lives. May we never shush you out of certain areas that we have sanctified of our own doing to recognize that you reign over all. We pray this in your name, the name of the King of kings before whom someday every knee will bow, Jesus Christ our Lord.